Tonight's presentation is without precedence. Um, the response, all of you, is evident of just how important the artist Frank Stella is to our understanding and our appreciation of art's evolution over the past five decades. Tonight's showing and all of the um, excitement leading up to it um, is a tribute to the arts is a tribute to art's capacity to engage in this artist's enduring relevance over a long and oh so productive career. I am thrilled that there is this much enthusiasm for the development of ideas and challenges of perception as realized in the work of Mr. Stella, one of America's most important and, I have to say, tenacious living artist. As you know, tonight's lecture is a preview for Frank Stella, a retrospective, opening to the public this coming Sunday and having debuted last fall at the Whitney Museum of American Art where it was the Whitney's first solo exhibition in their new space. The exhibition, which has been met with a great deal of critical acclaim, was curated by this museum's very own chief curator, Michael Opping. Someone who, as many of you know, can be counted on to garner a large and enthusiastic audience in his own right, making Michael and Frank Stella the dynamic duo which uh, accounts for tonight's overflow crowd. <laughs> Um, I would be amiss if I um, did not take this opportunity to let you know that signed copies of the beautiful and very insightful catalog with essays by Michael Opping, the Whitney's director, Adam Weinberg, and Jordan Cantor, as well as an interview between Frank Stella and the artist, Laura Owens, are available while they last in the, in the modern store, which on this occasion has agreed to be open for a while after the lecture. Um, it is important to note that Michael Opping and Frank Stella have been working on this exhibition for some time. And tonight we are very fortunate to be the beneficiaries of a relationship that is built through this process. And the stories they have to share as we listen to a conversation acknowledging important historic markers as well as heralding exciting new works and ideas. Please join me in showing our appreciation as we welcome Frank Stella and Michael Opping. Thank you. Whoops, wrong way. So, uh, Frank, I thought we would start in the present rather than the past and uh, go right to a, a slide of your current studio in Newburgh, New York, which when I first went there six years ago really surprised me because here I was visiting the father of minimalism and I saw a studio that was anything but minimal. And, um, how did it start from a small studio in, on East Broadway to this? This is literally, this studio is approximately one square acre enclosed. Well, I mean, the easiest explanation is in a small studio, uh, and as a younger man, I could move the paintings around. In this studio, we have overhead cranes uh, to move the pieces, so it's a fairly natural evolution if you keep on working. <laughs> this is the most recent work in the exhibition, and I wanted to start with it and then maybe go backwards. And um, if I'm correct, Frank, this, is, this was developed out of partly handwork, but um, working with a CAD program. And then, is this 3D printing? Was this made with That's 3D? what they call it, yeah, rapid prototyping. And actually, the rapid prototyping is a bit tricky because it's not that rapid. But it is, <laughs> uh, but it is basically a fairly new technique, although we were using it and other people were using it, of course, in the 80s. But the uh, advantage of it is that it can uh, deal with very complicated uh, intersections of parts uh, that can be still, could be done manually, but uh, it's not very likely that you can get them to be fabricated anymore uh, because the um, fabricators all work from uh, files, uh, computer files, and aren't really interested in the model that you make them. 
So you have to deal with what, uh, what, what the going way of building is. Uh, that's really what it's about, how you build something. Well, um, I think a lot of people who see the, the, the current work in this exhibition, and particularly my generation who consider you the father of minimalism and very simple linear designs, look at this and are, are a little confused. But having worked with you for six years, I've actually I've turned a corner, and I actually think this is a kind of distorted version of a black painting. It's um, almost a congealed darkness to this well, piece. Well, you could say it was uh, twisted into parts and pieces. But one of the things that's interesting about the process and the development of techniques is it's not all that, um, from the artist's point of view, fabulous. I mean, what's interesting about this piece is uh, it, if you look at it, you can see it's in three parts. And it wasn't designed to be that way. But um, because that's the limit of the size of the machines that are available for the printing, uh, that's how it came out. We could have glued the parts all together and it could have been one piece, but someone, and I'm not sure who it was, had the idea of uh, <clears throat> mounting them on these clear plastic plates and then bolting the plates together. And for some unusual reason, it, it didn't look all that bad, although I thought it was a really bad idea. We haven't done it since. <laughs> <laughs> Now I want to go back to 1958 and explore this darkness a little more. This is a painting that Frank did called East Broadway in 1958, um, right after he graduated from Princeton, and you were in a small studio. And um, I guess that what I'd like to ask, I've always wanted to ask is, so what is that, that dark shape about in the, in the center of this painting? And, and the beginning of these stripes, where... Well, the, the, the bands were always there from a few paintings before. Uh, and the idea of the band really came uh, from a sense of the surface that you were working on, which was the canvas, and using what are known as the house painter's tools or equipment. It's really just the path of the brush from one side of the canvas to the other. Mm -hmm. and if you alternate the colors, you get a kind of pattern one way or the other. And you can see it's not too fussy about it. But um, I think that there's something else, but which is not, uh, not exactly accidental, but not so worrisome, at least to me, when I was doing it, is this is a kind of uh, landscape painting in a certain sense, but it's an urban landscape right. painting. So the shape that is in or integrated in some way, or not integrated, depending on how you look at it, with the, with the bands is a rectangle. And the rectangle could be a lot of things. It could be a doorway, it could be, mm -hmm. uh, it could be a building, it, it could be just about anything, but it's basically rectilinear, and it's basically something about the way the city functions. Mm -hmm. And the colors are kind of obvious. The yellow and black is the asphalt and the taxi cab and whatever, mm -hmm. that's the feeling of the city. Well, one of the things that always impressed me about you as a young artist was that you were very upfront about early influences. And a lot of the in, uh, minimalists were not. And you always said that seeing Jasper John's uh, paintings of flags at Leo Castelli's gallery in 1958 uh, had an effect on you and that it helps you to understand how to compose a picture without it being what they called relational painting. Balance a small yellow thing with a large dark thing in the lower right-hand corner. This was a way of organizing the composition. Yeah, I, I think it's true in a way, but actually it wasn't what really influenced me. The influence of Jasper was in uh, <clears throat> the painting from, there was so, it might have been 56 or 57 in the Jewish Museum, which was the green target. Mm. And that was actually, it's hard to believe, way more sensational than the, actually the painting of the American flag. And that painting was, uh, since it's a target, it has, it's, a, it's the, the idea is the repetition, uh, the concentric squares, uh, concent <laughs> ba, 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 ba. Uh, the concentric <laughs> circles uh, in that painting. And that, uh, that was the idea. And then the flag just sort of opened it up and uh, you can see it. Um, in the painting that we saw before, although this painting might, I don't know what the date of that. The, the this is 58, yeah. but the, um, the um, you know, the literature, on your, the literature on your 
on your paintings, since you did mention John's, seems to yep. go into the fact that John. Well, there's no getting around it. Yep. I mean, it, it, there's a lot of things. I think but, probably Jasper is more influential as a force and as a new idea happening in New York at the time uh, than maybe even the formal aspects of the painting. I mean, it's the drama that's about the idea that something new can happen and it can change dramatically in the face of what was fantastically important and kind of heavy painting of abstract expressionism uh, of, the, uh, of, the, uh, of the 50s and before. But I, I do think what this exhibition shows, this retrospective, because we don't have a pure room of black paintings, or, um, is that what I've noticed is that there's really much more uh, of the feeling of abstract expressionism. This is a photograph uh, by Hollis Frampton. It was a series of photographs that Frank collaborated with Hollis on called The Secret World of Frank Stella. And it's Frank standing out front of the Cedar Bar, which was the watering hole for the abstract expressionists. This is where they all drank, and this is where they discussed their art. I don't know if you ever went to the Cedar Bar. I never. I, I spent a bit of time there. But I... Did you? Okay. <laughs> But actually, this, this is a little bit interesting in terms of the photograph. I mean, this, this is a play on a very famous photograph by uh, Fred McDara, uh, which has, uh, and ironically, I didn't think of it until I saw it here, but uh, Franz Klein and, and, uh, and, uh, and de Kooning are standing in, in, in pretty much the same place. And what you see is the rear <coughs> of a young lady there and... Um, uh -huh. And a famous <laughs> critic uh, standing to the left. So you see the whole scene, uh, Ruth Kligman, as it were, right. uh, with Harold Rosenberg. And uh, that was a, a very typical scene. But ironically, I mean, not, it's not irony, actually, but they were wearing sort of, they didn't have moth-eaten clothes. I mean, they actually had normal clothing on. <laughs> but this was one step in the direction of the beatniks, I guess. <laughs> well, I show it because I... I've, you know, what I've come to see over studying your pictures longer and longer is, is to, rather than looking at Jasper Johns, that your admiration for a number of the abstract expressionists really comes out in those early pictures. So on the left is a, is a 1950 painting by Ma Robert Yeah, and that's in the modern. I, I knew that painting, or, and it was reproduced an awful lot then, too. And then on the right is a painting by Frank. So, and Motherwell was creating this space within this prison-like structure. Um, and then I always felt with, not until I saw this picture, you know, a certain uh, appreciation on your part for Rothko that I think a number of your generation didn't see or didn't feel, maybe. Um, well, it's a little bit hard to say. I mean, one of the things is that there was an idea and it just, you know, was completely wrong, that the, uh, the black paintings were, in fact, very unpopular. But that didn't mean that they were against abstract expressionism, which was popular at the time. It so happened, as you point out, that they're plenty close to, uh, uh, to Motherwell and Rothko, for example. And, they, and they, were, uh, they were that way, not so much that they were meant to be that way, but that they couldn't be anything else. Mm -hmm. there, there, wasn't, there wasn't room for them uh, uh, to be anything other than that they, what they were, and which was paintings of their time. And they represented one thing that was a little bit difficult because Abstract expressionism, given that the painting itself was so important and so good, represented what was called at the time existential anxiety. Mm -hmm. And it, was a, it, was, it worked both ways. It was a kind of put down as well as a kind of explanation of what the intellectual attitude behind the work was supposed to be. But that's simply explained in just one, I, I won't bore you with the obvious, but uh, the Depression, the Second World War, the atomic bomb in Hiroshima and the Holocaust, those kinds of things that people live through, they lived through it as an adult and experienced it. I was, a, like a lot of other people, a young man. I only had some vague idea about it. I mean, I didn't know exactly what it meant, but it was a big part of their life. And then functioning as artists uh, in a community that was really quite self-enclosed, so it didn't have much play on the outside or interaction. So it was, a, it was still a small world. And when you 
uh, debuted the black paintings in 1959, and then you were put in the 16 Americans exhibition, which was unheard of for, an, uh, most people felt unheard of uh, for someone as young as you to be in a show with Johns and Rauschenberg and uh, Diebenkorn, and I forget who else was in that show. But mm -hmm. what, what, the literature. Louise Nevelson, actually. There was another, black, right. there was another black painter in that show. That's a good point. <laughs> All right, um, black 3D, anyway. But you know, uh, the, you know, the theorists who who talk about your black paintings talk about them as these conceptual gestures and these very dry material facts. When I think there is more atmosphere when you see this exhibition, you know, many of you, this will be the first time you've ever seen a Frank Stella black painting in person. I know it, it took me a long time to see one. You know, if go to MoMA and see the Marriage of Reason and Squalor. But you also, they have this incredible pull, your black paintings. But then you did some kind of radical things. Like this painting is called Daifana Hawk, which means high flying flag. And that is a song uh, that became the anthem for the Nazi party, which is a pretty radical thing to do in the face of these, you know, this generation before you who had just experienced World War II. I mean, was that... Um, That's tough to answer. I don't know. No, I mean, it came from the newsreels. I mean, and it's, it's the proportions of the piece. that uh, It's the, the conventional uh, Nazi flag hanging from the, uh, <clears throat> hanging from the balconies right. was uh, roughly that kind of proportion, red with the white circle and the black swastika. And it, uh, but it wasn't in the newsreels, of course. It was black and white. And, and, you, and, you know, it was an image that was repeated over and over again. So the form, in a certain sense, was there. Did you ever get hammered by anybody and say, you know, this is a, this is a, a, a Nazi anthem? I'm just curious if you did. I mean... Uh, no, nobody paid any attention, okay. actually. Oh. I mean, they, they, <laughs> the, the titles went unmentioned or unnoticed until uh, Brenda Richardson uh, did a show uh -huh. of the black paintings in 1973. And then the repercussions were repercussions. Uh, they started to talk about it, and uh, there was this idea that uh, basically this kind of symmetry and these ideas, you could imagine these paintings are... Right. They, as you know, having some element of directing your attention and controlling you and being basically fascistic. You know, it wasn't until I had to really start writing about this work that it also dawned on me that you could have been referring to John's. Uh, the high flying. You're flag. not the only one who said that. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought I was. Uh, uh, but um, uh, that's true. But it it it, it wasn't. Um, it wasn't in, in my mind. Okay. I mean, I guess in a certain sense it's obvious. Uh, and some of the other things, uh, you know, there's a problem with being young and not that it has anything really to do with being young, but having an idea about what you want to do and sort of following it through. So if you follow the idea through uh, with the black paintings, they were basically dark, industrial, and, uh, uh, you know, prone to disaster or destruction or whatever you want to call it, burnt out quality, one was called the Reichstag. Uh, so that uh, things, things are, you know, there and you, uh, you, it's hard not to pick up on something like Arbeit Mark Frey, which is if you're a, a person or a young person, you know, the idea that work is going to make you free has a, a kind of grotesque irony mm -hmm. and you, it, it's hard to resist. But again, nobody bothered about that. But in 1973, uh, a, a woman did call me on it. She was a survivor, and she said, how do I know what side you're on? And, mm -hmm. you know, it was perfectly legitimate. Hmm. <laughs> well, I don't want to spend too much time on the black paintings, although you know I love them. And I, I was curious, I mean, what, how you painted the black paintings also became a huge story behind the paintings themselves. So here we have a painting by, uh, of Jackson Pollock painting, a photograph by Hans Namuth and Jackson Pollock slinging paint in this sort of ritualistic gesture uh, in, in this barn on Long Island, and Frank making his black paintings in which he's going with one line. He's simply painting right around the edges, and they had almost a Samuel Beckett-like quality uh, that I think really affected people. How could we go, you know, in one generation from that to that? But it, that's but what it's very close to Rothko, and I mean, I'm not so right. sure what they, uh, these uh, photographs 
came out a little later. I'm not sure anyone right. knew how I painted them because they said there were True. white lines on black canvas. True. The, these, the, the, that photograph of Frank was really taken in 71, 72 by Hollis Frampton. No, it wasn't. Er, it, wasn't no? it was shown then, but it was, it was oh, taken. Okay. It was taken in 59. Taken in 59. <laughs> so we'll, we'll... When I actually painted it. <laughs> but anyway. That's when it was printed. <laughs> So we'll paint our way out of these black paintings just so people can see. But you know, I mean, I, I didn't see it before either, but that's the same can of paint that uh, Pollock has right nearby him. Right, it's both the, using the, enamel? The paint is in the can. It's not on the palette, it's not anywhere. So he's got it on a stick and he's throwing it, but I just have it on the brush and putting it down. And that paint is, is enamel paint. Yes. And why yeah. did you choose enamel paint? Well, partly because it was 99 cents a gallon. It was the best. <laughs> but I, I was familiar with house paint and with enamel and everything. And, and also, uh, there's a little bit that you can say, which I don't want to overdo it. But, you know, I thought of it in a funny way. It was, Mr. Clean was very popular then. I thought of it as industrial strength painting mm -hmm. uh, to use uh, conventional uh, commercial paints. But, you know, again, there was a, a precedent for that. Obviously, the enamel with Pollock, and Pollock again, and, and with other painters before with the uh, aluminum paint. There was a lot of talk about Duco right. enamel, right. and uh, it, it was in the air, mm -hmm. if not in the seat of bar conversation. Was it harder to paint with, do you think, than oil? Heavier? No, a lot more easier. More. Easier? Yeah. Okay. And intensely cheaper. I mean... <laughs> Well, I think, you know, when you look through your archives and you see these drawings that you did of black uh, and aluminum paintings, um, it looks like they were extremely deliberate, as though, well, you did these drawings, then you made the paintings exactly like the drawings. But, but then, you know, when we look at paintings like Delta, where it looks like it's a transition, in, like the move to the black paintings was more organic than just conceptual, yeah, right? Yeah, that was a painting like the early painting that you showed, which was basically a two or three color painting. And right. this was obviously a red and black painting at one time. And then I painted it out. And uh, because, you know, I was annoyed with it for one reason or another. And as they say, the next day it didn't look that bad. So I went on from there. <laughs> And the next series, the, the, the aluminum series, um, not only are you painting, as you did with the black paintings, uh, to echo the shape of the rectangular canvas, but now you're actually shaping the canvas itself. Yeah, I mean, there's a simple story behind that, too. I mean, the, the, the drawings that you showed before are, uh, were diagrams, mm -hmm. and the I was interested in, in having the band not be so straight or not follow a, a kind of straight line, have it have some activity, which is the jog. But I don't know how it... Um, anyway, in, in the earlier drawings, it ends up with a, a square in the corners or the notches are filled in. And uh, so I was talking with uh, Darby Banner, who was working down in Princeton at the... And I said, but I like the idea, I like the way it moves, da 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 da, da. But, you know, it... it you know, it ends up, I, I don't like how it ends in the corners there or in the middle. And he said, well, if you don't like it, take it away. And uh, that, that, that was the level of my uh, ability with carpentry to make a notch. And uh, so I did it, I took, I took it away and then it became a, a different idea. So did you, uh, did you stretch this painting yes, yourself? Yeah, believe it or not. Okay, because yes. that, yeah. It's not that hard, I mean, yeah. <laughs> it's a little bit. And then you start taking corners out of the pictures and, and sections out of the sides, and then you do an even more radical thing, which is create a hole in the center of it. Yeah, but which it's not, the I wall. mean, it's only radical once you, uh, once you give in to the geometry of the, of the, of the jog. So it, it's given, it, it's gonna end that way, and you take out that part. Right. But there was something also about acknowledging the wall behind the painting and, and a certain kind of literal space within painting. Is that your hand coming out of that? That's Hollis, yeah. Is that Hollis's hand? But that, to me, that says something about your sense of the reality of the space that that hole created within the yeah, painting. Yeah, it says a lot about how we had a lot of time on our hands. Yeah. <laughs> And, 
and then with the copper paintings, you start to take away so much of the painting that there's more wall than painting itself, it seems to me, with these Creed pictures. And I remember Saul LeWitt told me once that those were really critical to acknowledging the wall as the ground, as the pictorial ground for painting at that point. Yeah, but I don't, I don't you know, it, it, it may be for some people, but for me, it, it didn't really have much to do with that. It was about shaping and about what are the limits of shaping given a rectilinear bent, so you're taking away from the rectangle or the square. And this got to be about as much as I thought you could take away and still have it pictorial. But right. it's, it's very close to what the whole idea of, I suppose, what minimalism came to be, but in the sense of worrying about how literal something is. And these were not sculptures, okay? But they were very close to being sculpture right. or wall relief. And the reason that they were close is not so much in the uh, way they're diagrammed or laid out, but was in the actual material, which is, you had aluminum paint, which is metallic and that thing, but this is copper uh, paint for, uh, basically used uh, for, as an anti-fouling uh, cover for the bottom of boats. And it's really hard to manipulate. And, uh, and the paint and the, uh, the actual copper builds up. And so they, it made a different kind of surface. I mean, it just, it's not much of a, a, you know, it's different from the way paint or almost any kind of paint reacts. And so it's very close to being, say, one color or a sheet of metal or something like that. It's very, it's about as object-like as you can right. get it with painting and still be a painting. And some of your good but friends that's what I thought. were sculptors. I mean, and, you know, this is, from Frank's archives, there are these drawings that Frank did that are on stationery from the desk of Carl Andre, a sculptor who Frank knew. He went to Andover, right, with mm -hmm. uh, yeah. with Carl, and you shared and a Hollis. studio yeah. in Hollis, and you shared a studio briefly. When, was that um, about when was that? Yeah, they they were in my studio, as it were. Well, they. <laughs> And, and because they didn't have any place else to go, yes, but that's true, yeah. And years ago, Carl acknowledged um, your influence on his work a lot, and he tells a great story in which he was making these sculptures, these carved sculptures in his studio, and uh, they were carved on one side and flat on the back, and Carl said he invited Frank over to look at them. That's my studio, Is he invited that, me right, to be but, in my own studio. <laughs> <laughs> That's Carl Andre's sculpture in this studio you shared. And Carl, and, well, he didn't invite you to see it. He, he wanted you to see it. And you looked at the sculpture. This is according to Carl. And you walked around it and said, well, you know, sculpture's on the back, too. Mm -hmm. That was a hint to take it away. <laughs> to take it, well. <laughs> it changed, he, he claims it changed the way he worked after that to uh -huh. see the whole thing as sculpture not just as sort of sculpture as a pictorial thing. And then I find an incredible symbiotic relationship between this show of your work um, and this show at Dwan Gallery five years later by Carl Andre. It's almost like a positive negative in which Carl Andre is using bricks to define a voidal space in the floor and Frank is using paintings to sort of define the space of the wall. But this was in uh, the, the yeah, Castelli. Yeah, that's in Leo's gallery. Right. And I think one of the really interesting things about that is that space is about 25 by 25 feet. And when you see these exhibitions uh, in museums, the space in which these paintings are shown is probably two, three right. to five times greater than the actual way they were experienced, seen, the way they were painted and the way they were shown and perhaps meant to be shown. I'm, I'm also interested in the relationship between your work and particularly your experimentation with color and pop art. And um, this is a series of small paintings by Frank that are in the show called Benjamin Moore series, uh, titled after Benjamin Moore house paint, which was a very popular house paint at the time. Got the good they, housekeeping they seal of approval. They're quite still popular now. They, and they have way more shades, but anyway. <laughs> and these paintings were purchased by Andy Warhol. Um, and to me, I think that your experimentation with color in the very early 60s 
Um, I, I think Warhol saw that as something that he wanted to engage in too. I mean, I just think it's fascinating that he that he bought those. And you said he paid three hundred dollars for, mm -hmm. for, yep. for all Cash. six. Fifty dollars a piece. <laughs> I didn't pay any tax. Yeah. <laughs> Free and clear. Yes, but I mean, there's, uh, well, this is a good one. This the same thing. I mean. I did suffer quite a bit. I, I don't want to feel sorry for myself, but I was for a while, inevitably became an abstract pop artist, and that was kind of brutal to my sensibility. I wasn't sort of thinking that so much as, as that, that you affected pop more than they may have acknowledged through your experimentation with color. Not that you were being a, yeah, uh, no, an I, abstract I, I pop nothing, artist. I, I like pop art, actually. Yeah. That wasn't a problem. And this is a painting called Marrakesh. And um, were you the first sort of serious New York painter to use fluorescent and Deglo paints? Um, you know, it, you really, I don't know. I mean, because, uh, you know, people have been using whatever's available almost all the time. So I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't remember, but I mean, you know, there, there was a lot of fluorescent paint uh, in Jim Rosenquist pieces and stuff. I mean, it wouldn't have showed up exactly the same way, but it was being used. True. And this was 64, this painting. Yeah. Um, and then you begin to use color with this painting, Jasper's Dilemma, in which uh, it's almost like you're using color to confuse uh, the viewer's optics, so that there's a, um, a concentric bands of color moving into the yeah, center. It's upside down, line. too. But anyway. Oh. <laughs> That's all right. Sorry. I bet that isn't the first time that's no, happened. No, no, it is no, hardly. Um, so apparently you weren't confused by them at all. Um, but some of us get confused by them. Um, and then on the right is a is is this are these concentric bands of gray. So it's yeah. almost like you're forcing me to look at this thing with. Two, one eye on one side, one eye on the other side, and it, it, it sometimes they're hard to look at. Did, were you thinking? Well, about I, that? I don't think that they are maybe hard to look at, but I think I, I couldn't avoid the idea of, you know, people talk about how you see things and how you see paintings and everything, and uh, uh, behind everything somehow lur lurks the idea of. Uh, representation and the notion of uh, how, how, th how things look right and how depth is experienced and all of mm -hmm. that. And uh, so you have perspective on one hand as, as a kind of given, uh, which is division out the window. And then on the other side, on the other hand, you have the photograph, which supposedly gets everything right. But the photograph and, and in a certain way perspective are monocular. And I, don't, I guess right. I couldn't help, you know, uh, fooling around with the idea of using both eyes or having two images. Well, what's re really interesting to me is that even at this early stage, while you were moving into minimalism and influencing minimalist painting, you're still thinking about pictorial ideas. You never left the idea of investigating what looking at a picture is about. Not just an object on the wall, but you know how the eye wants to move into a picture or a picture advancing out or having a painting that seems to move laterally along the wall. Yeah, I think that, I mean, all the time, I mean, there are a number of ways that you can make a painting uh, active or uh, in some ways, you know, movement, you know, the paintings are have, have to have a sense of vitality one way or the other. And there are a lot of ways you can achieve that, but, ha uh, you know, having it, it move literally uh, is one of the ways. And what, what this slide for some does not show, I don't think, when you see this, this is the first painting you see when you enter the exhibition, um, is how the painting buckles, that there's illusion to this painting, that you didn't give up illusion. Well, a lot of abstract painters were saying, oh no, this thing has to be completely flat. It has to look flat, it has to feel flat. Your paintings had undulation in them that kept the eye moving. Well, I didn't believe it. I mean, I pretended it was flat. Mm -hmm. Well, when you see this, it doesn't look flat in person. It does to me. <laughs> I want it to look flat. Well, we'll let that... Sometimes you have to use the power of will. 
<laughs> well, you all go. You 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 all go in there on Saturday and Sunday and look at it, and you and you let me know if you think it looks flat. <laughs> and then you had this breakthrough with the uh, with the uh, irregular polygon series. It seemed to be a breakthrough for you, in which um, it, you were making the paintings thicker. I mean. With this painting, the stretchers are like this thick now, so it really has a, a feeling of a of an object. But you have, um, but it's such an unusual shape, and now you really, I mean, many people thought of Frank as the father of the shaped painting. Certainly not of the shaped painting per se, but the shaped abstract painting, Frank was the first one that most people think of. Um, and it was a fairly radical shape. This to me looks like a, it's folding. It doesn't. It doesn't look like a flat object to me. It looks like it's folding in space. It looks like a Jacob's ladder, um, or some form of origami almost. But maybe that, again, that wasn't at all on your mind. No, no it wasn't. No, it wasn't on your mind. <laughs> it okay. doesn't look that way to me either. Okay. But I can't help okay. It. <laughs> well, I'm inventing a whole new way of seeing this. Thing. And then there's uh, Chokura, um, which. Maybe I should ask you, what were you thinking in terms of this show? Yeah. Yeah. Actually, it, it's, it's very straightforward. And um, the issue is uh, geometric painting mm -hmm. and basically the history of geometric painting in, in the 20th century. And geometric painting consisted in most part of dividing up an area. Uh, you can although I don't look at Mondrian that way, but you can see the idea of how Mondrian has divided the space. And it, it, it became an issue of how space was organized and uh, how it was, in a sense, composed, but basically on a flat surface. And a, a typical example of that uh, was a, a, a Malevich painting, which you know I couldn't get out of my head, uh, which is a... a which I think is in the Stadelik now. But anyway, it's a blue rectangle, and on the right-hand side is a, um, <clears throat> is a, a blue Black. triangle. Mm -hmm. And uh, the triangle is laid over the top of the, uh, of the um, black rectangle. So that's a conventional way that geometric painting works. You have one thing on top of each other or one thing beside each other. And the idea here is basically the same idea, but um, something happened when I was working on the drawings, and what happens here is that the triangle, I hate to use this word, but moves into or mm -hmm. penetrates uh, the square or the rectangle. And uh, the result is that, that wouldn't, it could still be shaped and it could still be, mm -hmm. if it were one color, if it were, say, just a red triangle uh, sticking into the, the, to the green square, not much would really happen. It w would be a little bit different, but there wouldn't be something there that is there because of following uh, the, yellow, the yellow band that goes around framing the green part, uh, uh, accepting the gray and red triangle that comes into it. And we call that, or the engineers call that, spring-loaded. So there's the sense that the, that the triangle really is moving in to the green area and the uh, yellow is a kind of buffer or something, and it could, it could be expelled. So there's a kind of sense that's a little bit away from a kind of conventional relationship or flatness or how the parts would be together. And that was, uh, seemed to me, uh, a way of looking at geometry that was a little different from the way it was being done. And then you move into the, these are probably uh, some of your most famous paintings, or people who know even very little about contemporary art or contemporary abstraction know of your protractor paintings. Um, and how did that, how did it come about that you went into the curve and to use a protractor? Um, you know, it, the kids had the pro the protractors were around, but I, I was fooling around with it. But I think the real reason uh, that it happened was that the um, uh, that the irregular polygons it kind of ran out in a way they didn't they didn't expand. I mean, they they could be quite dramatic and quite dynamic within a uh, within a contained field, and they didn't have a way of spreading out. I tried a lot of things actually in, mm -hmm. in drawing the stuff that you don't see, and I was sort of uh, in a certain way, disappointed that I couldn't go anywhere with it. So I just switched gears, as they say, or just started working on something else. And the protractors, 
just presented themselves in a way that was on one hand kind of obvious and on the other hand, uh, you know, something happened when, in the fooling around with the drawing that reminded me of uh, um, uh, a medieval uh, manuscript illumination, some of the kind of interlacing things that happened uh, in, say, the Irish uh, mm -hmm. and in decorative art in the early medieval times. Which, and uh, Frank, at, at Princeton, you, as a junior, you wrote a paper on illuminated manuscript paintings in which you started to compare Pollock with uh, illuminated... That was that three was pretty, lines. Um, the most was a pretty was radical... The problems of kingship in, Carol, in Irish, Carolingian, and Ottonian manuscript illumination, which was a conventional uh, Princeton art paper, art historical paper. Anyway, yes, I did mention Pollock. So, which was, I thought, good. And the, and the rest of it, the, my ideas about king, kingship uh, weren't that interesting, I guess. So, um, so here's the, just to show that. But um, I wanted to ask you about, uh, oops, well, here's thinking about Pollock and et cetera. But um, I also wanted, to, oops, I'm going the wrong way. I wanted to ask you about the white bands between the colors and how that functions. In a lot of your pictures, you make sure that there is a thin <laughs> band of either canvas or white between a band of color. And why is that? What, well, what, you, you could say a lot of things, but I mean, because in a certain way, they're all, they're high, they could be hard edge paintings. They could be up against each other, but they're <laughs> really not. Uh, largely because that's very hard to do. Uh, so uh, you get a little bit of, uh, space, as it were, but the idea comes right out of Matisse and out of the Red Studio, and that was uh, terrifically effective somehow and influenced me. The idea of the uh, the negative line taking the place of positive drawing uh, mm -hmm. just seemed to really work for me and seemed to be, you know, have a lot of uh, it was easily adaptable in a lot of situations, and it was one way of avoiding. Uh, what was seen at the time as, as a big problem, which was drawing with paint. Uh, mm. And so uh, it, was, it was just a way to, so that you wouldn't, it actually was kind of a way of avoiding Picasso, uh, so you didn't have to outline things in black and uh, mm -hmm. move around. So uh, that, that was the kind of sense that you got from Matisse. It's, it's a way of freeing up the color in a certain sense because you don't have the linear <coughs> outline. This is a painting that's in the exhibition entitled Damascus Gate, and um, it's huge. I, I forget exactly how. It's 50 feet long. But 50 so it's feet not, long. But it's only 10 feet tall. And so I think, <laughs> I think what uh, some people have forgotten and, uh, and that this retrospective really shows is how you really push the limits of scale in abstract painting. I mean, this may be one of the largest indoor abstract paintings ever made. Um, and I think, you know, that was something that you seemed to be very interested in doing. Yeah, but by the time I made this picture, I was really aware and had, I mean, it compared to what was called decorative painting and everything, I mean, compared to the painting that you can see on walls and, uh, uh, and, and what happens in European painting, or, or just, for example, in the Louvre, I mean, 19th century French painting, I mean, the paintings are gigantic. I mean, this is, right. this is uh, so there have been in, uh, for a long time a, a tradition of, of large work uh, for whatever reason. And, but you did title this after uh, a number of these pictures after uh, um, ancient architecture. I mean, this is Damascus Gate, the, the yeah, gate into Jerusalem. Yeah, there was a fellow um, named Cresswell who did a study of, um, of Islamic architecture, but it was about the circular cities in the Near East that had a circular a city plan, basically. Uh, it's the idea of a city uh, contained by a wall, but by a circular wall. Mm -hmm. But it seems like this is when you really start to get very interested in architecture and the relationship between architecture and painting or creating relationships. Well, I think that's probably true, but and, I, I didn't know it. And then um, in, in 1970, uh, Frank had a retrospective at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Um, he was 34? 
34. I'm no, how can I tell? Somewhere. It doesn't matter. Yeah, 34. <laughs> you were, I'm older now, so You were 34 matter. years old, and many, many considered that amazing, that, 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 that MoMA would give a retrospective to an artist that young. Um, and at the same time, you had some knee surgery, you were laid up in the hospital, and then coincidentally, Richard Myers uh, the architect, Richard Meyer. So Frank is getting more involved in architecture, gives him a book on... Um, um, the Polish synagogues. Polish synagogues. And uh, this is a, an image from that book. And you started doing drawings in the hospital, and then from the drawings you went very quickly to materials, which you always seem to do, uh, into these crazy constructed maquettes, and then uh, you you blast into the Polish Village series, which is, you know, you worked very long on those. Yeah, well, well the one thing we don't see here, I mean, that's the image of the, uh, of the synagogue before it was burned down, but uh, right. in, the, in, the re, in the discussion of them after the war, and the, they were reconstructive uh, diagrams. Of, uh, it's really the, the, the geometry inside the synagogue, which is really the most interesting, uh, and it's really a kind of, uh, kind of, I don't know how to put it, but it's it's woodworking uh, and wood construction brought to a very high level mm -hmm. of complexity and actually interest. So I mean, they are wooden, but it's uh, they're they're really formed by the wood, and the shape represents uh, the ability to put things together with wood. I mean, it almost seems at this point in the career, um, you know, in the early 70s, that you're actually building paintings rather than painting paintings, at least in the beginning. Um, and in, in some cases, you know, you work with just, this is wood. Um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's fabricated, yeah. But uh -huh. anyway, that, that's what it was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And then you do get involved with color. And, but the paintings are, they're painted, but they're actually, when you see this painting in the exhibition, you need to look at it carefully, because you'll see that it's layers of things. So the color is not just paint against an edge of paint. It's actually a section of maybe canvas or another material yeah. laid down in a color. Yeah, I mean, there, there are a number of materials. I mean, this one happens to be just canvas, but right. uh, some of them have homey materials like homosote and uh, press board and whatnot. I, I show this because I've never seen you that relaxed, yeah. ever before. <laughs> And I have I found and I this photograph and I just had to show it. But he's worn out from making these Polish village things. He's building constantly, oh, hammering. Um, the only really in interesting thing about that is it's still there. That's a Tex Mex restaurant on Houston Street now. <laughs> and they haven't really done much to it. The floor is pretty much the same as it. Anyway. And that painting uh, in, on the right-hand side, oh, yeah, not that's the far in the right, show, yeah. that's in the show, Karmalenka. But th there is one other slightly interesting thing. I mean, you can see that we're working a lot, and a lot of people are working on it. And some of the people who worked on them are here tonight. But nonetheless, while we're working, uh, you can see the other models there. And that's for the Brazilian painting. So I mean, ideas uh, flow together. I mean, so we don't just work on one thing at a time. Or one thing leads to another in a very obvious and direct way. Um, I show this slide because in regards to the relationship between painting and architecture, this slide does not do this justice at all. But So you need to look at this carefully in the exhibition. So it's a series of layers of materials that Frank has brought together. But it, the painting is also embedded into the wall. And, and this is the first time with the Whitney showing in here that you've been able to do that, right? Well, the... the piece being put into the wall is a, uh, is a play on the actual surface of the painting, which is in front of most of the activity in the painting. It's a kind of uh, bas-relief, mm -hmm. basically. Beautiful painting. Um, and then in the 80s, I mean, many of the artists of my generation, you know, they were looking for someone, a hero to bring back the idea of... of yeah, but this must be from the 70s. Well, it is from the 70s, but they saw, they saw them in the early 80s. I'm talking Julian Schnabel, David Sally. They would have seen them in the late 70s when they were made. But, um, you know, I've talked to them, and they all thought, well, here's a guy who's taking all of this bricolage, all of this material, trying to regenerate painting with material, 
Um, and they were, you know, these were the so-called neo-expressionists. And you were sort of deconstructing the space of painting in a way. I mean, when you look at, when you see this, it may look like a design, but these physical gestures are floating out in front of the picture. They're not, they're not sitting on the ground. I mean, it's fascinating to me to see how this, the gesture is actually a, a piece of material. It isn't, you know, a painted gesture. Yeah, and it's on the ground. I mean, that's a yeah. tiny bit Pollock-esque. Uh, yeah, it is. That's true. <laughs> this is a painting called Talladega that's in the show. And um, very, very dense with many, many, many layers. And the fact that it's titled Talladega, it's titled after... Um, uh, well, they, they, there were a lot of, uh, the idea, the paintings were called circuits, and mm -hmm. they're they about racing circuits, yeah, basically. Mostly Formula One, but that happens to be a stock car circuit. And you, you've you driven, you've driven Formula mm -hmm. Ones, right? Yeah, oh yeah, sure. Have you, no? <laughs> no, I've been to driving school, which oh, is a oh, lot different oh, from it, oh, and oh. I wasn't invited. <laughs> and, I, and I wasn't invited to test out either. <laughs> Well, I can tell you one of the scariest aspects of doing this exhibition was driving with Frank. Um, every, anybody who knows Frank knows that he drives very fast. And, well, I don't know, the police in, in your... In, okay, let's, let's okay, go on let's to another go. topic. <laughs> um, so the, on the left is a, is a photograph that Hollis Frampton took of you blowing a smoke ring. Um, I don't know what the date of that would be, um, but um, it's an early uh, indication. Yeah, it, it, it's, I think I know when it is. I think that was on the uh, studio on, uh, on Walker Street. Okay. Anyway, so that would have been in the middle 60s. In the middle 60s. Yeah. And so um, it shows this early interest of yours in the idea of smoke and how it articulates space. And then later, you did these more formal, I don't know if formal is the word, you built a box? Yeah, we built a box and, and, we, uh, and we photographed it. Uh, I, I, I blew the smoke in from one of the corners and then we had uh, the six sides uh, had cameras. Mm -hmm. and, so we, and we, so we were able to photograph them uh, uh, enough to be able to uh, scan them and shape them. So we had six views. And what you, what you see here, if, if, if I'm correct, is that there's, there are mirror images of each other, right? Is the one on the, on the bottom, the two bottom, um, are those mirror well, images of is, each other? Well, not southeast and west, okay. and top and bottom. It's six sides. And this, this painting, which is in the show, again, these slides, you're going to think that this is this big, but where do you see this in the show? This is a very amazing painting called St. Michael's Counterguard. To me, it looks like a materialized smoke ring, but that actually isn't its, that isn't the inspiration so. I, for it. Yeah, and I think it's way before the idea, I mm -hmm. mean, outside of just blowing. I mean, the idea of the smoke was to, uh, to be able to see if we could model something, because at that time, sort of, computers were very big and they could do a lot and everything, but in, in, in essence, we really couldn't, we couldn't program the smoke uh, to perform in different ways than it does when I actually blow it. You could say, conventionally, you change the conditions, mm -hmm. uh, the air, the moisture, and sort of all of those things, but it didn't work out because the smoke uh, is made up of particles and the numbers get too big for the computers, at least at that time, or for their interest in, in doing it. So we went on. And then the Moby Dick series that, um, that was inspired by a trip with your kids to an aquarium, and you decided to do, um, I mean, it's it, Melville's famous Moby Dick. You reread it after that trip to the... Um, aquarium, yeah. I, 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 you know, that was something that was out there, but, but what I was interested in was uh, 
you know, most of the things we did were flat. I mean, it's the flat plane. And one, it, it really becomes ultimately an issue of topology, which is the, uh, curved surfaces and how they uh, react or how you react to them, actually. Uh, and so that was a way of, uh, um, and most of the constructions, certainly before this, were essentially planar. And this was a way of uh, changing uh, the plane in a certain way. And obviously, once you do that, then you're really tempted to deal with the, um, with the thicknesses and with the way the topologies inter can interact. So uh, it, it becomes more complicated, but in a way interesting. Well, I mean, it's a great homage to Melville's you know, 1851 novel. And Melville's book had 135 chapters, and you did uh, one, at least one work for each chapter. In That's that true, but it wasn't, I only did it out of a kind of perverse reason, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, when I mentioned to one of my children that I was going to do one, 135, one for each chapter, but it, but it would seem too daunting, so, but he said, it, it doesn't matter, you, can, you don't have to do them all. And that whole idea that I didn't have to do them all was just overwhelmingly challenging. I don't know why, coming from your <laughs> own children. <laughs> So, of course, you know, what I see in the, in the Moby Dick series a lot of, and there's a temptation when you take a book and then you translate it into an abstract language to, to, to try to connect the narrative to this abstract language. And, you know, I haven't been able to connect really specific things, but I certainly see a lot of water image, uh, imagery. And um, and this work particularly fascinates me because it's called The Blanket. And that's a chapter in Melville in which um, the narrator talks about the fact that when the whalers were cutting whales up, they discovered that they couldn't quite figure out how many layers of skin they had. That they would go through, and some of them were translucent and some of them weren't. And to me, that seemed like a, a really good metaphor for your approach to painting. All of these different skins, um, you know, you, all the layers that you, you put into your paintings. And then you directly refer to, to a, a famous painting. Uh, yeah, um, I think actually there was, I was trying to finish with uh, Moby Dick, <laughs> but I was still uh, working the same way. And then I, I, I couldn't find a title that I could tie this to Moby Dick, so, or it didn't come to me right away. So then I thought of The Raft of the Medusa. By Jericho, which is mm -hmm. a, um, but it, it, it does, I mean, it, you know, the, the composition does feel like those bodies moving up the mast of this uh, Well, it had a kind of raft-like quality, I don't know, mm -hmm. just largely owing to the uh, way we ended up uh, putting it on the, I mean, these are some details of Raft of the Medusa, which in which you see Frank using molten metal almost as paint, which kind of re refers back to the aluminum paintings. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I mean, molten metal and um, and paint. I mean, it's it's a question of material that you work with, but there's something about uh, th technically uh, casting. Uh, always becomes hard, but the, when the material is molten uh, and viscous, I mean, it's really, it does a lot, and if you just, it, it, it lends itself uh, to a painterly expression. Can you tell me how this painting was made, Frank? I keep, I still try to figure it out, and I know it has something to do with well, computer. Well, you have to know the people who made it. <laughs> uh, it's a uh, it was a collage. I mean, mm -hmm. it's a painting of a collage, basically. And so the uh, and the collage is uh, the collage is photographed, and then it's uh, projected in, in sections on a, on a canvas. So it's enlarged in that way, and then the, uh, it's basically copied. Okay. And uh, uh, and but it's all paint, and so uh, what looks like collage on the on the piece is just thick layers of paint. Mm -hmm. uh, some which, which were actually collaged onto the other layers of paint. 
I, I mean, I, am I wrong to see remnants of, of the smoke rings in this? No, they're, uh, they're there. That's I mean, I what I... Kind of literal. And then this is, uh, this is the last slide we'll show, but this is from the Scarlatti series that's um, named after a, a Baroque harpsichordist named Domenico Scarlatti. Yeah, a composer, yeah, and, and player, and performer. Yeah. So in, in, in this case, we're talking about using material and space to um, create an analogy to music, to sound, maybe? Um. I don't think so. I like, uh, well, I mean, I, I hope that some of it comes through. I mean, it's color, okay? So, yeah. uh, and people do talk about the color in music. But, um, but the, the real attraction to Scalotti is that this music or these, the harpsichord sonatas are really popular music. It's basically dance music of, from the street. And uh, uh, that's what I'd like the way, it's, that was the kind of attraction that it was, uh, it was music, and uh, whatever it had in it, it was it was not uh, very esoteric, or well, it is in a way because it turns out to be so good, I guess. But 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 it wasn't wasn't really intended that way, although it was seen uh, partly that way in the time in in its time. But uh, there were the other attraction was that of course Scarlatti w was began this work when he was 66 years old. And I got interested in it when I was probably 67 years old. I mean, it seemed like an idea, that uh, something that I could work with. Well, that's the last slide I have. So I thought we could briefly open it up uh, to questions for Frank. You can answer some. Or I could answer <laughs> some. Um. Ferrari. Nobody? Yes. Are you still working in the nano paint? <laughs> Um, well, it's, uh, it's basically uh, automobile paint, so, uh, uh, so it, it's an enamel, yeah. I mean, but it, it's actually, it, it was terrible, I mean, but it, it's water-based now, so it's much easier to work with. Go ahead. Um, yes, yeah, so when you were working with the smoke rings, um, have you given thought to trying to uh, reproduce those using 3D printing? Um, yeah, we have, but I mean, they're, 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 you know, if you make something solid uh, that's made up, you know, something that's uh, as amorphous as smoke, uh, it's okay, it's a kind of image, but um, we don't actually don't have it, but I have, we, we've modeled a lot of uh, images of the, of the smoke rings, but they, they're interesting in that they're a little bit different, but they, they don't have much to do with smoke, finally, when, when you get done. Hmm. Yeah. How much of your work is actually made with your hand at this point? Um, well, it depends on how, how you think about it. Uh, a lot of the uh, pieces, uh, they're, the model making, uh, a lot of the models, uh, uh, particularly something as complicated as this, which is a 3D model, are based on one, basically on a spiral uh, piece of uh, foam or something like that, and then later plastic that you cut out. And it's a two conventional two-dimensional uh, image that you cut out and bend and twist, and that's what these are. So they're, um, you know, they, when they're enlarged and everything, uh, it presents a lot of different problems, but I mean, the, I, I don't know what you what you're getting at, but what I can do with my hands. But uh, uh, I, the the imagery, one way or the other, and the pieces uh, are pretty much. Uh, I, I don't see them as not being hand driven, uh, but that depends. I mean, for example, uh, the poured metal. Uh, so somebody has to melt the metal, and someone has to pour it because. You know, I burn myself and maybe a lot of other people pouring it. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, I can draw in the sand and I can organize mm -hmm. it and I can throw the things in on top of it. So there's a lot of physical involvement uh, with the work. But again, uh, after a certain point, there, there's, um, you know, you lose your reach and, and your rhythm and so. So, there, so you have to compensate for it, mainly in the model making. But, but in the 70s, when you were making some of these monumental abstractions, surely you didn't paint 
all of those by yourself, right? Uh, no, I, I didn't. But I mean, I was one of the so, people on the thing painting. I painted my side or my part <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> yes. Uh, what happened, did you say the phrase avoiding Picasso in the context of the pinstripes? No, it wasn't about the pinstripe. It was about the, the notion. Oh, well, it was. I'm sorry. But it was about the, 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 the notion of, uh, of how, how you make a line and the idea of making a line by letting the, uh, with Matisse, letting the white canvas show through between, uh, uh, the, say, a blue and a red area. That was the idea. It would rather, and if, uh, if you had the same, say, two figures or a figure on the ground, uh, that was Matisse's way of doing it. And that of course, emphasized the color and made it sort of easy to make it big in a certain way. But if you were imagine that in, in, in the Picasso paintings, that uh, uh, you would have an outline of the, uh, the image in black, and it would change into something else. So, Mr. Sill, I think it's fair to say that for the average museum goer, they're going to be a little bit confused, you know, looking at a piece like this of why it's not a sculpture, it's a painting. No, nobody what, said it wasn't a sculpture. How do you explain that to, 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 to people? Um, I don't think it takes much explanation. I mean, if you say it's a, uh, um, I mean, if you think of a, a painted sculpture, uh, a, say polychrome medieval sculpture, I don't see much different between that and this. Uh, uh, the only slight conceit here is that this this piece is is, is um, has an armature, and the armature is different from the uh, is is supporting the piece, and the armature could stand free, but it's leaning against the wall. As uh, and uh, and it, I think it is important in the sense that the wall in this case is more probably like what Saul would said. I mean, the wall becomes a, a, a kind of part of the piece. And, and you but not, but not that necessary. But I mean, it ha it needs a support. Uh, if it were freestanding, uh, it would look pretty much the same. If it were in a conventional space, like an exhibition space, like a gallery, if it were freestanding outside, it would probably be horrible. Uh, but that would only be because it, hmm. it, it, you know, it's really hard to compete with Mother Nature, and it's very hard to compete with the average mall environment that it would be likely placed in. So, in a in, in a gallery or in a museum exhibition space, you you take advantage of the wall, the backdrop. And you have said in the past that, I, and I think it's really important to understand that that uh, sculpture has a, a pictorial side, just as painting has uh, a sculptural side. So you can land on whatever side you want to land on, right? Yeah, any way, any, any way that works, as they say. <laughs> yeah. I was honored to see your exhibition at the Whitney in December. Now, I was curious, as you bring this show, this show has been brought to this museum, how did this museum enhance and highlight your work? Does it, or uh, actually? <laughs> well, uh, I'm not sure what the question is. Well, it, I think what she's asking is how, how has the show changed from the Whitney to here? Uh, and I think there are a few less pieces in this mm -hmm. presentation, also this building is different than the Whitney building. Um, I think this presentation, the, the presentation at the Whitney had incredible amount of movement in it, um, partially based on the architecture and, and the way we all installed it. But in this building, I think things are framed a little more. So it's, I think it's a slower, it's a slower view through Frank's work. But you haven't seen this show yet, so it's hard for me to... Uh, yeah, but I also, I don't think that, um, that it, it, it's inevitably different, but, um, but that what's different is the exhibition as a whole or how you think that you, or I would think that I experienced the whole, the whole, the whole work, uh, body of work. You know, I think it, it's worth saying uh, something about what Malraux said about, um, he used Van Gogh as an example and he said, you know, we worry about the intensity of the uh, of the individual works and how and how we see uh, his work and and how we think about it, but um, but for Van Gogh, what was important was the ensemble 
the whole thing, the whole the vision he had of not his individual works, but of how they all fit together as a whole. Mm -hmm. And that's what exhibitions uh, like this do, or that's the question that they raise anyway. Um, I was curious, like, okay, so this whole time we've been coming off the wall, we've been building into this more sculptural. Would you ever consider going back to the wall, or like back to a more um, I have a lot of hints about how great flat paintings are, and how good, <laughs> <laughs> and how cheap canvas really yeah. is on a stretcher. Is no, but I, um, you know that. The large painting that we showed, the earthquake in Chile, I mean, that's basically a con very conventional flat painting. It just happens to be quite heavy and quite big, but I mean, it's a painting in a very conventional sense. So do you ever see yourself, though, like, retracting back? Like, it's, it's very forward, it's always um, proficient, I don't know. Uh, but do you ever see yourself, like, pulling back into a more, a less dimensional, <laughs> well, look, if you have a, I, 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 if you, you're talking about whether the painting should be flat, but what, what the, if the surface that you're working on is flat, okay, but there's very little painting or surfaces that are flat that uh, painters don't deal with in some kind of way, in which, I mean, de Kooning said it, I mean, it's about flatness, but you have to have, but where's the volume? And so it's, it's, it's almost instinctive. One way or the other, uh, volume needs to be expressed. And so there's a, a modest advantage, if you're worried about that kind of problem, to just accepting it. And then paint on the volume that actually exists. I think we can leave it at that, Frank. Thank you so much. <laughs>